Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today it is time for another Ask Me Anything, uh, which everyone really requested. It's been about two months since we did the last one, so I'm excited to get back into it. Uh, real quick before we start, because I have been seeing these comments on social media lately and I just want to be careful, uh, I burned myself really good uh, cooking the other day, so I have two little hot oil burns on my fingers here. I wanted to mention that because I've seen a lot of folks with skin conditions uh, or burns on their hands being like their whole comments are like, oh my god, you have monkey pox. Um, so I just kind of wanted to avoid that by mentioning I was just not very careful uh, frying some stuff and, and burnt the crap out of my finger. So that's what those are. All right, so getting into the questions, um, Casey wants to know the age old question, if you had to restart your piercing journey, what would you get done first? Uh, and theirs would be their septum piercing. And actually, it's going to be the same answer for me, mine would be my septum piercing. Um, I got my like first earlobe piercings when I was like, ridiculously young, like an infant. Um, and I had other lobe piercings done throughout my younger years. I remember being like, nine or 10 and being at the mall with my mom and seeing like, a piercing pagoda and being like, Oh my god, like, can I get my ears pierced? And she would say yes. And they didn't require any ID or documentation, of course, very safe. But my first like full body piercing was my nostril. And I was young and willful and really wanted it done with a hoop. Uh, and then I think I moved on to some ear stuff. I think I got like some more cartilage work. Uh, like maybe a conch or something after that and then moved on to more facial stuff. But I'm, I'm pretty sure I had my nostril, my librette, and my eyebrow all before I had my septum. Um, and if I could go back in time and do that over again, I would have done my septum first because it was so easy to heal. It was able to be flipped up and hidden. And it was just, it would have been a better introduction to piercing for me. And instead, I kind of jumped right in and started off with some piercings that were uh, pretty hard to heal. Nostril with a hoop is not an easy heal. Uh, and in hindsight, I wish I would have given like young teenage Lynn uh, an easier experience getting started with getting piercings. And I wish I would have started with some stuff that was a little bit easier to get and heal. All right, Nima Tucker, and I hope that's the correct pronunciation of your name. And if it's not, um, you know, feel free to correct me in the comments, um, has some questions about binding with nipple piercings. And I actually like this question so much, I decided to do a full length video about it. Um, so by the time I post this AMA, either my video on binding will already be up or it will be coming up shortly. Um, but I liked this question so much, I decided to do an entire video on it. So that will be coming soon. The one thing that I'll mention here, and this is like, uh, I hate like breaking this news because it makes me feel like a bad guy, but I really haven't found a tried and true proven safe way, 100% safe way to bind with nipple piercings. Um, the amount of pressure that binding causes, be it like a light sports bra binder to a full strength binder to trans tape, uh, it just really tends to cause nipple piercings to migrate and reject. Um, I have a couple tips and tricks coming in my full video of ways you can try and work around this. But basically, the one like biggest piece of advice I would give to anyone binding with nipple piercings is understand that it really greatly increases your risk of rejection and migration. And if you don't want to deal with that, or if you have top surgery plans in the future, and that scarring could affect your top surgery plans, you probably want to err on the side of caution and remove the piercings if you're going to bind. I wish I had like a better answer than that for folks. Uh, but at present, I don't. Um, but yeah, stay tuned because I have a whole full length video coming about this. Um, and I do have some tips and tricks to try and make binding safer. But yeah, my biggest piece of advice is it definitely can hurt the piercings. So understand that going into it. Honestly, that's the whole reason why I won't get mine redone. Um, because I bind too often these days. And it's just, it's just not gonna work out. Purple Pisy wants to know what to expect from a front of house job and said that they guess it differs on shop volume, um, but wondering how it differs from salon and retail environments. Um, and front of house can definitely differ greatly depending on the size of the studio, the volume of the studio, and the services that the studio offers. But in general, front of house are kind of like the bookends of a client's experience when they come to the studio. So when a client first walks in, front of house are usually gonna be the first person to greet them. They're gonna get them checked in, figure out are they getting a tattoo? Are they getting a piercing? Do they have an appointment? Are they a walk in and get the client started on paperwork? Front of house is going to check ID, make sure the client is of age to get things. And typically, if they have an appointment, they're going to check the front of house in with that artist or piercer and let that person know that their appointment is here. 
Now in some studios, front of house also operates as a stylist. So front of house is also doing the entire jewelry pick out. So let's say a client's coming in for an ear curation, they're gonna work with front of house on that curation. Front of house is gonna suggest piercing locations, exact placement, jewelry, all that good stuff. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of folks are surprised to hear. I think a lot of people are under the impression that the piercer does the styling. And there are some studios where piercers do styling, but I'm going to be completely honest um, and say that in a lot of higher volume studios or with a lot of busier piercers, um, my front of house is way better equipped to do the styling than I am. Front of house is working up front with the jewelry all day, all night. A lot of times front of house has a hand in like displaying the cases and inventory. Um, and I tend to work in studios that are a little bit more high volume. So I'm doing a lot more piercings during my day. Um, and because of this, my time is spent in the back. It's in the piercing room. So I'm going to be really good at checking your anatomy for something and great at installing your jewelry. But remembering every single piece that's in the case and all of like the current trends and everything going on, that's where front of house really, really shines. And my favorite way to work as a piercer is in studios where front of house do a lot of the styling and pick out just because I think that they are more suited for that than I am. And they're able to give clients a better experience. Not to say that I don't do any styling at all. Um, definitely for certain clients or certain projects, I do still like to take over the styling. Uh, and I like to do styling from time to time, but I'm just able to acknowledge that if I have to choose between spending my time styling or spending my time actually piercing, I prefer to spend my time actually piercing and doing more piercing and give the styling to someone else. Um, and not every piercer feels that way. I know some piercers who love doing the styling and they do all of it soup to nuts. And I think that's fantastic. And that was how I was for many years. Um, but I'm just at a point in my career where I like to have front of house do that. On the styling aspect, front of house oftentimes does a lot of stuff with the jewelry. So stocking and displaying the cases, jewelry inventory and inventory management, things like that. At a lot of studios, front of house also does photography. So they take pictures of the piercings that the piercers are doing, uh, and even sometimes pictures of the tattoos. This is super beneficial because in a really, really busy studio, if I stop to take like five or 10 minutes to take pictures of something, that can cut into my next appointment time or cut into my next client. But if I know my front of house can take those pictures for me, I can just keep rolling through the clients and doing the piercings. Um, front of house is amazing. I think it's one of the most crucial positions in piercing studios and especially in the last five years. I, you, you know, most places, especially higher volume places, especially places that aren't operating appointment only, um, they need a great front of house in order to make that happen. And a great front of house can completely change a client's experience with the studio. And they're fantastic. Everyone go tell your favorite front of house that you love them. Emily wants to know about my hair color journey and it is so funny to me. It makes me smile so much to see someone asking me this because five years ago, I was that person who changed my hair color uh, literally like every other month. Uh, yellow is actually the last color my hair has been. And when I say the last, I mean, I have done all the other colors first. Um, let's go ahead and throw up a montage. But I started coloring my hair in, I wanna say, ninth grade, maybe even earlier, maybe even eighth grade. Um, and I started out with some more natural colors and then I convinced my mom to let me go blonde and it was downhill from there. And I just started doing every color you could imagine. I've had rainbow hair, I've had like sunset colored hair, I've had solid single colors, color blends. Um, and almost all of this color I do myself because when I was starting out, it was a struggle for me to find a salon that would do the fantasy vivids on my hair. I one time accidentally dyed like a whole wash bowl pink because they had white wash bowls. I don't know why a hair salon had white wash bowls, but they did. Uh, and I was not invited back. Um, so I just, I just started doing the fantasy colors myself. Um, and right when I was leaving Florida, I had rainbow hair. And while it was beautiful, it was an absurd amount of upkeep and I just couldn't do it anymore. And basically the only thing I hadn't done was yellow. And so I was like, whatever, I'll give it a shot. If I love it, cool. If I hate it, it'll be really easy to do something else over it. Uh, and I ended up loving the yellow and I've had the yellow for three, almost four years now. And the maintenance really isn't too bad. I touch up my roots about every four weeks like clockwork. I'm just really on top of keeping my roots bright and fresh. Uh, and because I'm so on top of keeping my roots touched up, it keeps the rest of the color pretty nice. Now I have had the yellow for a very long time. I told myself I was going to keep it till conference, which has already passed. And so I'm kind of starting to think about changing it. If I change it, I think I'm going to do like a silvery white next. 
um, just because underneath the yellow, it's my hair is pretty light and lifted, um, and I know how my hair responds. I think it won't be... It'll be easier to get to silvery white from this than it would be from a lot of other colors that I've had. Um, just knowing my hair, knowing what my hair can tolerate. And if I decide that I don't like the silver or I don't want to deal with it, it would be easy to go back to the yellow or go back to something different. Um, but what's your verdict? Let me know down in the comments. Are we like, is the yellow hair my brand? Are we married to it? Um, or are we ready to see me change it up with a different color? I'm literally so on the fence. Skylar says, I plan to get a good amount of piercings, but I'm not sure exactly which ones. Would it be reasonable to make an appointment to have a piercer tell me what I have the anatomy for, if they have any opinions or ideas? Absolutely. I think this is such a smart idea. I wish I did this when I was younger. Um, and I th think more people, especially folks who know they want to be very modified, should do this. Uh, book an in-depth consultation appointment. Book an in-depth consultation appointment, uh, come in with a list of all the piercings you have on your like maybe dream list, and that list can be super long, it's fine. Um, and also come in with some questions that you think you might have about getting or healing these piercings or jewelry goals long term. And have a piercer sit with you, assess your anatomy for every piercing, talk about what will and what won't work and explain to you why, talk about what will and what won't be reasonable for healing and explain to you why. And then your piercer can also give you some aesthetic opinions. Like maybe you really wanted a doth, a triple forward helix and a rook on your left ear, but that's also the only ear that's good for you to have an industrial on. And your piercer might be able to say, well, we might have to tweak some of these goals. So we might have to put the industrial on this ear and the triple forward helix on the other ear or help you figure out ways to still have things be aesthetically pleasing, but work with your anatomy and what you are and aren't suited for, and also your jewelry goals. You know, if you wanna wear a huge giant cluster piece in your conch, but you've only got the anatomy for your doth on that side and you wanted a big, huge piece of jewelry in your doth, those two pieces of jewelry might overlap and might not look the way you want it to. So your piercer could kind of help you advise what's gonna work well with your jewelry goals too. But I think this is so smart. And if you know you want a bunch of stuff, um, come in, get a consultation and have a piercer help you plan. We can also tell you a good order to start these piercings in. That way you have an idea of what time frame will either get you to all of your piercing goals sooner or get Get you to your jewelry goals sooner we can just kind of help you plan out the whole process random neon bird wants to know any recommendations on what to eat with a new tongue piercing uh now while there are no like strictly off-limits food um you can eat what you want to eat with a tongue piercing my biggest piece of advice is always listen to your body. If you go to eat a certain food and it hurts or feels weird or uncomfortable, don't keep eating it. Uh, spicy food is a great example of this. Some people might be able to handle spice with a fresh tongue piercing just fine. Most of us probably not going to enjoy that experience. Probably not going to be a great one. Uh, beyond that, I find that food that you can cut up with a fork and a knife and softer foods tend to be a little bit easier for a lot of folks. Uh, trying to take like a huge bite out of a burger and chew it might be tricky, but like cutting up a piece of pizza um, or like some smaller pasta, not spaghetti, tends to be easier. Um, eggs, mashed potatoes, soup, smoothies, soft food is obviously going to be easier. And then when you have your tongue freshly pierced, your tongue is swollen and so it's just a little hard to move around in your mouth. So rather than pushing food around as you're chewing with your tongue, I know this seems so silly, but you can tilt your head to one side or to the other and chew on that side. Uh, and that does make things a little bit easier. But honestly, once the initial swelling goes down and once you get that downsized, it's really easy to eat with a tongue piercing. You are gonna be fine. Antro Blake asks, is it safe to assume that a studio with an APP piercer will always do safe piercings, even if they're not done by the APP piercer? No, it is not safe to assume that. It is also not safe to assume that an APP piercer will always do safe piercings. Um, so the Association of Professional Piercers, the APP, is an organization that deals with health and safety. So they look at, does a studio have the right autoclave? Does the studio have the right setup for safe reprocessing? And does a studio have safe jewelry for initial piercings? But the APP does not certify skill. So an APP member can use a perfectly sterilized, perfectly high quality piece of jewelry and do the most crooked, most shallow, most incorrectly placed piercing possible. Beyond that, there are sometimes issues with APP studios secretly using low quality jewelry. And while the APP tries to stay really on top of catching that, they need clients to report those instances um, and they need people to report with evidence and that can get tricky. There's a few studios that I am aware of that I know use low quality jewelry but it hasn't been able to be proven 
enough to remove the membership. Um, so you always need to be careful, even with APP piercers. Um, you definitely don't need to be as cautious with jewelry quality, but you know, still be cautious, still feel out the situation. Um, but remember that the APP doesn't certify skill. So still look at portfolios, still ask good questions, you know, still ask to be shown angles, things like that. Um, because they can be an APP member and still do bad piercings. The flip side is also true. They can be not an APP member and use amazing quality jewelry and do amazing, clean, straight, perfect piercings. Um, so it's not always like one or the other. The APP is a great baseline to find safe piercing and safe piercing studios. You definitely have a high, much higher chance of finding a great piercer than you do just walking into a random studio in your town. But you should still hold APP members accountable and ask us, all of us, all the same questions you would anyone else and check our portfolios the same way you would anyone else. Landon wants to know, is it safe to wear more than one pair of ear weights in your ears? And the answer is yes, but you have to go about it carefully. Um, I could probably do a whole video on weight stacking if we wanted, um, but when we look at wearing more than one pair of weights at once, there's really two big factors. One is the overall weight, so we want to make sure we're not exceeding a weight that is comfortable for our lobes, and the other is the distribution of weight. So if you've got a bunch of weights but they have thinner wearables and you want to stack them, that can put a lot of uneven pressure on the bottom of your lobe. You might want to stack them through an eyelet or something like a chaos software piece. On the flip side, if let's say you've got one pair of weights that's big and heavy, but it's got a huge wearable, and then you want to layer a second pair in front of or behind it, but they're pretty small and light and they have a smaller wearable, that's probably going to be fine. But you definitely need to pay attention to how much weight you're putting on your lobe and how that weight is being distributed. And depending on those two answers, you might want to do the stack through an eyelet or through silicone, or you might just only want to wear the stack super short term for like an hour or two at an event or for a photo shoot or something like that. Jamie wants to know if I'll be discussing more about cultural appropriation at some point. Um, no apologies. I have mentioned this in a couple different videos where cultural appropriation is relevant. I haven't done a full video on it, although I do have some blog posts on my website that touch on it. Actually something I'm working on um, and you know, I kind of tend to pre-produce projects. So at any given time, I have a bunch of different videos or a bunch of different blog posts that I'm working on in the background. And sometimes these take a really long time. Uh, I published a piece earlier this year, um, kind of introducing some education about cultural appropriation in the industry on my blog. It took about six months of work between myself and my wonderful co-author Olarumi, and I'm working on more projects in that vein and collaborating with other piercers of color and queer piercers and piercers of different religious backgrounds and clients of different backgrounds to do more content about cultural appropriation. Uh, I have no idea when that content will be ready because finding time to get people's schedules together to sit down for long calls and then transcribe interviews. Um, it takes a while, but it is something that I'm working on and I'm excited about what I've already put out about it and I'm excited to continue working on even more. Um, I just ask that folks be patient with me about these projects. They require a lot of care and a lot of sensitivity to be addressed and handled correctly, which is not something uh, that I want to rush. So I do like to take my time. I do like to bring in co-authors um, and other folks when I talk about these subjects, but I am working on it and I'm hoping to produce some more pieces about it as time goes on and as I'm able to get them finished up. So Lost Neon Cat said, I know you said you have Brazilian ancestors and I'm curious, do you speak Portuguese? Uh, and unfortunately I don't. Uh, I was made to go no contact with my dad's side of the family from a very young age, like two or three maybe, maybe even younger. Um, so while there are family members on that side that speak Spanish and possibly Portuguese, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I never got to be around that family or learn that, um, which super sucks for me. And in the past year or two, or three or four, I've definitely been on like a journey of reconnection with that side of my family and that side of my history. Uh, and I am currently working on learning Spanish. Uh, I'm pretty slow. <laughs> it's pretty difficult, uh, but I have a couple friends who are helping me out and I'd love to learn and really master that language and maybe even make educational content in Spanish one day uh, and then go further to learn other languages that would allow me to communicate more with my extended family. So maybe one day I would love to. And then Jenna Webb wants to know, what are some of my hobbies? Uh, when I am not doing all things piercing related, 
be it actually doing piercings, uh, making these videos here on YouTube, making my TikToks, writing my blogs, or writing and researching for sacred debris, uh, which does take up a huge chunk of my time. Uh, I really like being outside. I love like hiking and kayaking and my partner and I, uh, we go for hot girl walks. Uh, so we get our little water bottles and we walk around different areas of our neighborhood uh, and check things out and have a bunch of fun. Uh, I'm very into anime and manga. Uh, I watch a lot of anime as far as shows go, especially a lot of like fantasy and show and work and magical girl stuff. I also play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, we have a group that meets regularly on Fridays that my partner has been a part of for basically a decade now um, that I am now a part of as well, which is super fun. And when we're not doing that, we're playing a lot of board games and tabletop games, huge tabletop and board game fan. I'm also a really big reader. Uh, I read a lot of fantasy books and a lot of science fiction books, and I'm starting to get into reading more nonfiction, um, but right now like fantasy and sci-fi just has my heart. Uh, I also am into fitness. Uh, I go to a local pole and yoga studio in my area, um, and I do a lot of pole fitness, specifically aerial work, uh, and I've started getting into weightlifting and going to the gym more often, so I'm excited to explore a little bit more of that. And then I've always really desperately wanted to learn how to sew, but I've just never been uh, like at a point in time in my life where I could do that. But it is like, that has been a hobby that has interested in me for literally ever. Uh, <laughs> I have like some sewing stuff on my Amazon wish list, and maybe one of these days I will just like bite the bullet and buy myself a sewing machine. But I really like desperately want to teach myself how to sew. So maybe this winter when I can't be outside as much because I hate the cold, uh, I will cave and buy a sewing machine and finally explore sewing. And then I don't know if cats count as a hobby, but I spend a shitload of time with all of our cats. So I'm counting it here. That is it for today's Ask Me Anything. I loved all the questions and I liked how in-depth a bunch of them were this time. Uh, I continue to find these so fun to film and so fun to make and so fun to do. And as per usual, I wish I could answer everyone's questions, but then this would be like eight hours long uh, and probably really annoying and I feel like no one would watch it. <laughs> but if you like the Ask Me Anything, if you want me to can you continue doing them, if you want me to make them longer, uh, let me know in the comments down below and maybe I'll try and make this like an every other month series will do like a cheeky little Ask Me Anything. I'll try and get to everyone's questions. Uh, but thanks for sitting down and hanging out. As per usual, if you like my content, please hit like and subscribe. Your support is so helpful to me in continuing this journey of making educational content. And I'm sure we will sit down and hang out again soon. Bye.